Ignition sequence start. Good morning, and welcome to Mission Control Houston and the International Space Station Flight Control Room. This is where a team of specialists is always on duty to keep a close eye on the systems of the space station and work with the Expedition 59 crew members through their daily agenda of science research and station maintenance. With all of the station's power channels now operational after a partial outage early in the week, Commander Oleg Kononenko and his crewmates are wrapping up their regular workday while looking forward to next week's arrival of a dragon at the door with tons of needed supplies. Welcome to Space to Ground. I'm Dan Hewitt. Fixing the station's power system? This ain't like dust and crops, boy. On Monday, flight controllers found an issue with one of the station's main bus switching units, which distributes power to two of the station's eight power channels. While astro droids still aren't a thing, teams in the ground were able to control the robotic helper known as Dexter to swap out that failed unit with a spare. After some quick tests and checkouts, the new unit was online and the station was back at full power. And with the space station fully operational, it's almost time for another Dragon resupply craft to take flight. SpaceX is ready to fly their 17th resupply mission to the station. Packed with about 5,500 pounds of supplies and science experiments, Dragon will ride a Falcon 9 into orbit and begin a chase down of the space station. It'll make the station run in fractions of a parsec and arrive a few days later, where crew members will be waiting to robotically capture it, so tune in. Ever wanted to go to the Tashi station to pick up some power converters but had too many chores? One robotic helper that just arrived on station could help out. Astro B, NASA's new free-flying robotic system, will help astronauts reduce time they spend on routine duties. Able to work autonomously or via remote control, the set of three robots are designed to do things like take inventory, document experiments with their built-in cameras, or even work together to move cargo throughout the station. While they won't be able to help you with your lightsaber skills, they got their first chance to power up inside station this week and will soon be flying around to make life a little easier for crew members living and working in outer space. Keep sending in your questions using the hashtag space to ground We'll see you next week, and may the 4th be with you. NASA TV and NASA.gov will go live at 1.30 a.m. Houston time Saturday with live coverage of the launch of the Dragon cargo ship Dan referred to. Launch itself is targeted for 1.48 a.m. And a successful launch on Saturday means rendezvous and capture and installation of the vehicle to the International Space Station this coming Monday, May 6th. We'll have live coverage of all those events, too. Flight Director Ann McLean will be one of the station crew members involved with the unpacking and the repacking of the Dragon cargo ship. It's all part of what she trained for during more than two years of preparation for her first spaceflight. McLean says that her training benefited from something she learned about achieving goals. It's actually something she learned during her time playing rugby. <laughs> So the first time I played rugby, I was actually 18. It was the year before I went to West Point, and I was walking across the Gonzaga University campus, and I saw a group of people playing a sport that was unlike anything I'd seen. There was a lot of tackling. I couldn't figure out what was going on. And uh, one of them asked me if I was interested in trying it out, and the very next day, I started in my first game of rugby. Uh, I'd played throughout my time at West Point, and then when I was a Marshall Scholar, I was fortunate to study uh, postgraduate in England, and there I started playing at a higher level. In 2004, I was selected to the U.S. national team. I was fortunate to play a lot of rugby, and then I also coached a little bit right before uh, I went to test pilot school. My last weekend playing rugby was the weekend prior to finding out I became an astronaut. So rugby has surprisingly helped me a lot as an astronaut, and when I'm training in the spacesuit in the EMU, 
and we're working in our in our large pool, the neutral buoyancy lab underwater. We're under there for six hours at a time and you really work yourself to physical and mental exhaustion. The only other time that I've hit that point of exhaustion is the 60th minute of a rugby match. When your body gets that physically tired, you can't mentally give up. You actually have to think about things more deliberately with more clarity because you're more prone to mistakes. And it's the people that can overcome that physical and keep going with the clarity of mind that win both rugby matches and that find themselves successful uh, training in the spacesuit. I am Anne McLean, and I am an astronaut. The International Space Station is the site of science in many different disciplines, from investigators who are trying to take advantage of the weightless environment to gain new insights. For example, the station is home to equipment that could help answer some big questions in modern physics. The Cold Atom Lab facility produces clouds of atoms that are 10 billion times colder than deep space. And thanks to the microgravity environment on the space station, we can observe these atoms for much longer than we can on the ground. Physics is one kind of science being done on the International Space Station. Biology research is another, and the MVP, the Multi-Use Variable Gravity Platform, is designed for research involving many different kinds of organisms and cell types, and it's especially important for fruit fly research. It'll allow researchers to study larger sample sizes than before, and it'll also support fly colonies for multiple generations. We're looking to answer the question, what is the effect of spaceflight on the host? The host here being the fruit fly or Drosophila, and also on a pathogen. Uh, so the bacteria actually is one that can infect the fly, very similarly to the way it would infect, for example, a human or any other organism. The genetic makeup of the fruit fly is actually very similar to humans. If you took the human genome, and you looked at all the genes that you know are important for function, in that category, in that library of genes, there's 75% similarity between the human genes and the fruit fly genes. In a box this size, thousands of flies can be flown and brought back so that even if you see an important difference that is small, you can get statistically significant data because you get 3,000 flies or 4,000 flies coming back in a box that size. We have a very nice new piece of hardware, the company TechShot. We've been working together with them for the last few years uh, in developing a very capable piece of hardware. What's so special about uh, the TechShot MVP 
is really that there are two internal carousels inside the unit, and each one of them can produce anywhere from zero to two Gs. So it'll be the only payload of its kind in the U.S. segment that can do this. The sample modules themselves do transport to and from the station in the uh, cargo vehicles, but the, the payload itself, the locker stays on board the station permanently. We are interested in human exploration. We want to go to Moon, we want to go to Mars, we want to explore the environment outside of low Earth orbit. And to do that, we need the help of these surrogate model organisms. Because once we understand the genes and the pathways, then we know what the countermeasures are that we're working towards. The International Space Station is helping scientists learn more about plants, too. The Plant Gravity Perception Investigation is germinating seeds in microgravity to study the plant's ability to detect gravity and then adapt to grow in that environment, which, of course, will be necessary on future missions to deep space when crews will need to grow some of their own food. Think about the fact that the shape of every plant you've ever seen is the result of gravity sensing. Every plant has gravity sensing cells, and those cells contain dense bodies. They're packed with starch. And when that organ is displaced away from its starting position, those dense starch-filled packets, they fall to the lower wall of the cell. What we don't know is much about what happens after that. And so our question, our experiment is aimed at what's the least amount of gravity that a plant can detect and cause that kind of sedimentation. And the way we're getting at that is to add fractional gravity to plants as they grow and ask the plant, how about that? Can you feel that much? How about, here's a little bit more. We'll turn it up just a little more. Can you feel that? We're growing 120 of these at all different gravity levels on the station. So we have planned a whole series of experiments at fractional gravity levels while we're visualizing the plants as they grow. So we have a, a cell culture chamber that has two rotors, uh, centrifuge rotors, and these sort of stack, they align along the radius of the rotor um, at different distances. And the, the amount of gravity experienced by the plant varies depending on how far it is along that rotor arm. Our lowest treatment, I think, is down to about uh, six one thousandths of a G, all the way up to one G to get a good control for, for Earth response. Plant shape is, is critical uh, in breeding programs to determine optimal growth uh, for crop productivity in roots and in shoots. So lots of uh, potential applications, uh, both off the earth and on the earth. During their time on the International Space Station, many astronauts had the opportunity to participate in spacewalks, which are critically important to keep the station functioning properly to support the science that goes on inside and outside the vehicle. In this demonstration video, astronaut Ricky Arnold gives us a tour of the critical parts of the space suit that keeps astronauts safe as they perform maintenance in the harsh environment surrounding the space station. <laughs> So we are standing in the Quest airlock, which is divided into two parts. We have the equipment lock and we have the crew lock. This equipment lock has a hatch right here that closes and the crew lock has another hatch. The EMU or the extravehicular mobility unit is our spacesuit, and it's divided roughly into two parts. We have the hard upper torso, which is almost like a turtle shell. Um, it's a hard fiberglass shell. And then we also have the lower torso assembly. These spacesuits are our own little spacecraft, and they have everything you need to keep you alive out in space for seven to eight hours, um, maybe even longer, uh, depending on how hard you're working. The only thing that they do not have, and they have radios, it has oxygen, it has carbon dioxide scrubbing, it has temperature control, it has everything you need, except for one thing, a restroom. And so when we get ready for our EVA, the first thing we put on the morning in the morning is a, a diaper. And um, that's our first layer. Then over the diaper, we put on a pair of long johns, and that's to keep our arms and legs from getting scraped up. It also provides a little bit of wicking in case you're getting really hot and sweaty. 
The next layer is our liquid cooling garment. And the LCVG has little tubes running through it, which allow water to circulate within inside the LCVG to, uh, to provide cooling when we're outside working really hard. So we've got the diaper, we've got long johns, we've got the LCVG, and then we're gonna wear our space suit. Seven layers from the bladder on the inside, which maintains, maintains pressure, and that's a rubberized bladder, all the way out to the white layer on the outside. The crew member inside the space suit is also wearing this, what we call a Snoopy cap. Um, it's a communications cap, we have a radio, so we can talk to not only to Houston, but we can talk to people on the space station and to each other. So we wear this communication cap inside the, inside the helmet. Also a part, another component, key component of the, uh, of the EMU or a spacesuit is the helmet. Uh, you can see the helmet has a, a gold visor uh, which pr protects us from the, the rays of the sun that we can bring down. Uh, it's pretty bright out there and this gold visor uh, helps reflect the rays of the sun so we can actually see and operate uh, in, in daylight. At nighttime, we can raise this visor up, gives us a clearer view, and additionally, we have helmet lights built into the helmet. On top of the helmet, we also have a television camera, so the ground is able to watch us while we work through these TV cameras. The work is really all done with hands, and um, so our gloves are really our most important piece of equipment in order for us to work outside. And one of the real challenges of a spacewalk is you have this heavy gloved hand, which is inflated, so it wants to stay like it's blown up like a balloon. But we walk by grabbing onto handrails and making our way along the ISS. So every time you move your hand, you're fighting against a, a balloon that wants to inflate. And then on top of that, all of our equipment is based on using your hands too. So after six and a half, seven hours of kind of fighting against this glove, it's a really long day and your hands are probably the thing that are most exhausted after, after seven hours out on an EVA. Well, we're going out to work. You probably saw me move uh, this mini workstation. The way we carry our tools is on a mini workstation, which is carried on the front. Every single tool we use is tethered to us. We do not want to accidentally create satellites. Our primary way of may may remaining attached to the ISS, if we're not using our hands, are these waist tethers. And you can see they just have a big hook. They go around a rail or uh, you know, anything else on the ISS and latch on and it actually has a locking mechanism as well to hold us nice and tight. So we always always want to have one of these attached if we're not holding on with our hands as well. The back of the EMU has our life support system. The life support system uh, contains all the equipment we need from a, from a UHF radio down to the oxygen tanks that provide primary oxygen. One of the challenges inside this sealed environment, it's very easy to carry our own oxygen with us, but we generate a lot of carbon dioxide, particularly when we're out there working very hard. So to combat that and to deal with that, we have these canisters called uh, Medox canisters, which are just silver oxide. They are carried in the backpack uh, along with a very large battery, which provides all the electricity for us. I don't have a battery here to show you today because we're in the process of charging them. We're about a month out from doing a spacewalk and we've already started getting ready for that. So this Maddox canister is, about able to, is able to remove about uh, seven to eight hours of carbon dioxide that a human can generate inside the spacesuit. EVAs have allowed us to build and maintain the ISS, repair mission critical hardware, investigate malfunctions, install new hardware, and the view, unbelievable. See you next time. While today's astronauts work on the International Space Station and train for upcoming missions, NASA is preparing its next class of astronauts to be ready for future assignments. The members of the 2017 astronaut class completed their first year of astronaut candidate training at the Johnson Space Center in Houston last year. Now here's a look at that next group of space travelers as they moved out of the classroom and into more hands-on training.
first six months, we were really getting our feet under us, just getting to know one another, really doing mostly classroom uh, type training. Next six months has really picked up the pace a lot and we've covered so many different things, everything from learning to do space walks in the neutral buoyancy lab, a giant swimming pool. The first dives were incredible. Uh, the team of people that work at the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory are amazing. They worked really hard to make it as much like space as possible, like doing a real spacewalk. Getting in the suit for the first time was just really surreal. We get into the suit, you get pressurized. It's a really cool experience to finally get in that spacesuit for the first time. Totally unreal. I remember being in the pool and looking at my hands, and they have actual spacesuit gloves on, and just thinking this couldn't possibly be real life. We went to New Mexico to study geology, but first of all, we spent a week here at uh, Johnson Space Center uh, working with an incredible group of PhDs that taught us geology, very intense uh, week-long uh, class. We went out to the upper gorge region of the Rio Grande del Norte, and um, for that, it was really cool because we went to a region that had a lot of volcanic activity, and we're basically trying to piece together the story of how how that region formed. We were broken up into teams and we got to actually go out and map different structures in the fields, pick up rocks, break them open with a hammer and uh, actually form our own hypotheses and then set about trying to explore them. It was a really great experience. KC trip was incredible. Getting out there and for me the first time to get to go out and touch rockets uh, was really incredible. We got to see capsules, we got to see CST-100, we got to see SpaceX. For me, I had never been there before. This is, you know, the site where we've launched so many incredibly important missions through NASA's history. I had been there back in 2006 for a shuttle launch and to be back almost 12 years later as we're getting ready for a commercial crew to launch from Cape Canaveral again, you could sense the excitement building in anticipation for that. So that was really cool to see. And it was really exciting for me to see just how alive it really is today, all of the different vehicles that are being built and being launched right there at Kennedy. The land survival trip, um, we went to Maine for that, where the military does their survival training as well. And that entailed a lot of learning things like land navigation, how to build shelters, but it was also especially important for team building and group dynamics. It was a great way to bond with the whole group. A few of us have also gotten a chance to work at Ellington Field doing field maintenance, it's called. So uh, using the T-38 as a way to train on mechanical tools, doing repairs, learning things like sheet metal work, and uh, just generally getting to know also some of the mechanics at Ellington Field. And on Friday, I have my first, what would we call an integrated mastery. So it's going to be me in the mock-ups behind us with a group of 20 to 30 instructors as I go through my first exam. Uh, first major exam for the International Space Station. Across the board, one of my favorite parts of this job has been getting to know my other classmates. Everyone is so collaborative, really working together to lift each other up and building on each other's strong points. This group has been incredibly close and every single one of us um, adds a lot of value to the team and I think that's been one of the best parts of being here and training here. The space travelers of today and those of tomorrow have at least one thing in common with the explorers of old. They are all at the mercy of the weather. The astronauts and the systems of their future space vehicles will have to be protected from the radiation of deep space. And that's why today's scientists are working hard to improve our ability to accurately forecast dangerous space weather. The space we travel through. Presented by Science at NASA. When seafaring nations began to explore new regions of the world, one of their biggest concerns in making the journey safely was how to cope with weather. They could harness the wind for power. They could rely on the sun and the stars for navigation. They could build sturdy ships. But if a storm rose suddenly, they were at nature's mercy. More than five centuries later, our nation is once again on the cusp of exploring new worlds. And once again, one of our concerns about traveling long distances is the weather, space weather. While space is a vacuum, 
it's not 100% empty. Particles, energy, and magnetic fields travel through the void. Much of these emanate from the sun's corona as part of a constant outward flow known as the solar wind, which stretches well beyond the orbit of Neptune. There are also high-energy particles or cosmic rays in the mix, which travel vast distances from dying stars or supernovae. Earth's magnetic field and relatively thick atmosphere act as a shield against the most harmful forms of this radiation, but in space, there is no such deterrent. If we want to travel through this space, we need ways to protect our astronauts. These particles can affect our technology, tripping onboard electronics. Dr. Yari Kalatavega, space weather scientist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, notes, we are working hard to forecast when these particles will be at their peak, such as during solar flares or coronal mass ejections. Acute exposure to these solar energetic particles is a serious concern for astronauts and instruments. Therefore, having a better understanding of when to expect solar activity is important for safely sending our astronauts and spacecraft through space. Ironically, such space weather activity can actually protect against another threat to astronauts. The sun's activity can block dangerous cosmic rays coming from other stars, which are constantly present, illustrating the complexity of the system NASA tries to understand and mitigate for our space travelers. Over time, sea captains learned when to sail their ships and when to stay in harbor, based on their accumulated knowledge of the weather. It's more risky to be on the water in the Caribbean during hurricane season, and you'd want to consider avoiding the northeast coast of America during the height of winter. Dr. Colada Vega says, it's very similar to what we're doing today. We're constantly developing and testing new models to predict space weather, and we're constantly seeking new data to refine those models. A host of heliophysics missions observe space from a variety of vantage points, not unlike terrestrial weather sensors, which work in tandem to paint a bigger picture of our space environment. In August 2018, NASA launched the Parker Solar Probe to help us better understand the sun's activity especially what drives the solar wind and how energetic particles get accelerated. This data could be used to improve models of space weather forecasting, ultimately helping us find new and better ways to shield our spacecraft and protect our astronauts. Whether it was the oceans ancient ships traveled through or the space we will one day travel through, we know this. Keeping a watchful eye on the environment around us is key to ensuring safe passage. For more information about what matters in space, visit science.nasa.gov. If you'd like another look at any of the stories we feature today, check us out on YouTube and Facebook at uh, the addresses conveniently provided. While you're there, Take a look at other cool stuff you can find, because there's lots of it, about NASA, America's human spaceflight program. And while you're out there on the Internet, check out Houston We Have a Podcast. That's folks here at NASA talking about their work in all aspects of space exploration. The new episodes post on Fridays, so today we post part three of the Heroes Behind the Heroes series, picking up as the stars of our show fight off another technical challenge to rescue the Apollo 11 mission control tapes for posterity and for academic research. Go to nasa.gov slash podcasts. You can find today's episode, which is number 90, as well as parts one and two, and all of our previous episodes, and even more, the full library of all NASA podcasts, all of which you can also listen to on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and SoundCloud. This is Mission Control, Houston. Thank <laughs> you.